everyone to another exciting and new YouTube lecture here on period four, the second great awakening and reform. So let's go ahead and get started into our lecture because I know you guys are all so eager and ready to do this. So here we are. Revivalism has come back to America. We're bringing back that old time religion. Actually, it's interesting to think about this expression, the Second Great Awakening. It's actually during this time that we're going to talk about here, the 1820s, 1830s, where the religious leaders during this time felt like the religious leaders of the 1730s and 1740s, your Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God, George Whitefield, those guys, they will say, created a Great Awakening in America. And they are now bringing back a second Great Awakening. So that's where we, that's, this is the time where we get this expression of the Great Awakening. It's these guys who name it that. Um, but it's much, much more than that first one. This Great Awakening is going to cause some of the greatest social reform in all of American history. So let's get into that. Oh, well, look at this. Here's a couple of quotes from some authors. Historical interpretation, hmm, I wonder why I'm putting that here. Oh yes, if you're in my class, we're working on short answers. And question number one is always, how do you do historical interpretation? So here are two historians who are both talking about the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, but they're coming at it from two different perspectives. So I'll let you pause for a moment and read this, and then I'll, I'll come back when you're ready. All right, good, you're ready. So, yes, make sure you think of these two and what, what exactly is different. Why are they talking about the Great Awakening in, from two different perspectives? We'll just leave it at that. So we'll go on. Our key concept here, we're going to start in 4.1, Roman numeral 2, letter A. So here we see the rise of democratic and individualistic beliefs. Uh, we see a response to rationalism. A change to society caused by the market revolution, right? Along with greater social and geographical mobility, all contribute to a second great awakening. So what is a cause of the great awakening? The second one? Well, here are four things that you can say helped to bring this about, right? Among Protestants that influence moral and, very important here, social reforms, inspired utopian and other religious movements. But let's kind of give a real thought to really what's going on here in America at the time. We have to remember the Jeffersonian Republicans have basically won out. We're in the era of good feelings. The Federalists are gone. But remember how Jefferson felt about religion. Jefferson believed in a separation of church and state. Remember what he did to the Bible? He took a pair of scissors to it, remember? I mean, Republicans at this time period believe religion has its value and it has its place, but it's not part of government. That's a big difference than how Europeans thought about religion. Religion and the state were often the same. Now, after the American Revolution, and now that the uh, after the Constitution and the Federalists are now gone, with the Republicans in control, they're really going to push this idea of separation of church and state. Now, most states in the Union did not have religious requirements to be a voter, but there were those that did. As the Republicans took over, more and more states began to take away the requirement of being in a church to become a voter. That's a very important thing. The disestablishment of religion of, in New England begins in 1817. It, it starts in the New England states. They were holding on to the idea that you still had to be a church member in order to vote, so making church and state the same. But it's gradually going to happen over the next decade where each of these New England states will start to dis, uh, disestablish the idea of an established religion, is what I'm trying to say. No established religion in their state in order to become a voter. This is very radical for us. Um, a lot of church leaders at first were very hurt 
They thought that this would doom the Christian faith, that, that people wouldn't partake anymore. But in actuality, it invigorates religion in America. The idea of volunteerism, the idea that now you volunteer to be in a religion or not. This becomes a cornerstone of the American experience. And where religious leaders in New England, particularly, and even upstate New York, were very much afraid that this would be the downfall of religion, they begin to realize very quickly it is what's going to keep religion not only going, but give it that shot in the arm that it so greatly needs. And this is what starts the Second Great Awakening. America is becoming more democratic. A massive rise of democracy is happening during this time period. More people can vote. And when we say more people, obviously we mean the majority of all white men. No, no longer land requirements to vote. That's going to be gone. Church membership requirements, that's going to be gone. And you remember, we've talked about in some states, free black men have the right to vote as well. You have an explosion of democracy. At the same time, the market revolution is taking place, which makes sense. If I can choose my job, if I can choose where I want to live, if I can choose if I'm going to go west or not, I want more democracy. I want to have more say in my government, and I want to have more say in my life. This is going to become a cornerstone of what this Second Great Awakening is. People now can choose religion. They can choose what faith they want and how, how to partake in it. And once they start doing that, then they're going to choose to make America truly great. They're going to bring about social reform in America. So it's a growth of liberal religious expression is what's going to happen. While the Second Great Awakening started off very conservative, right, very, uh, you know, Puritan, they were a lot of that Congregationalist religion was still around. Very quickly, it took on more liberal ideas, and a, and a truly American idea of Christianity is going to emerge now because of this. Revivals, as I showed you in that picture, those that becomes very, very important to this whole process. Tens of thousands of people uh, in New York. There are so many revivals; they begin to call it the burnt out districts. You know, because of hellfire, right? that they're preaching so much hellfire, they're preaching so much salvation, they begin to call it the burnt out districts. But this greatly appealed to both merchants and the working class. For the merchant, it became obvious. If I can have a, a devout working class who will work, they won't steal from me. They'll work hard. Christians are hard workers. I'll get more productivity out of them. The working class enjoyed it too because it gave them a sense of hope and a sense of clarity for what they were doing in life. So this was a very big time in America religiously. The one guy who was like the guy at the time is this Charles Finney, a ex very progressive liberal religious teacher at the time. He really starts to express the idea of being a free agent. Free will becomes the big teaching that he comes, he doesn't come up with, I can't say that, but really promotes. God has made man a moral free agent. You, like you can choose to vote for who you want to choose for, you can choose what job you like to have or where you want to live, you can choose salvation as well. We have free will. And that's why this is going to be so important as a movement, because it's going to lead people to think, okay, I want religion, I'm going to become more devout, but now let's choose to make society better. And a big reforms are going to come now. Just to give you an idea, and there's our good friend Charles Finney, a painting of him. Oberlin College is established in 1833. How important is this college? Well, he comes to teach there in 1835. He will teach there for the rest of his life. This is one of the most progressive colleges in our history. Um, it started with a student rebellion at another college because they would not allow black students. So some 75 students left a college and eventually helped form this one at o uh, Oberlin. In 1835, they become the first college to admit African-Americans. In fact, Charles Finney said he would not teach there 
unless we could teach African Americans. That's how forward thinking he is. It's also the first college in America to fully admit women. Another thing that Charles Finney was very pro, women must have a voice. One of the things he would do when he would do his outdoor revivals, uh, remember they last three, four, five, six days, he started to call women up to give a testimony. Now in the beginning, men would boo, right? Men didn't like that. They would just, they would see women coming up and they would wonder what's going on. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, all right, man. Stop that. Really, bro? Yeah, exactly. Really, bro? Um, but he kept doing it, and he kept doing it, and he kept doing it, and eventually men began to accept this. Uh, the Grimke sisters, these two women who were from the South but hated slavery, so they left their family. They couldn't live in that anymore. He began to call them up to give their accounts of what slavery was, and the Grimke sisters become very instrumental in the abolition movement and in the suffrage movement. And it's because men like Charles Finney become very progressive thinking in how to actually try to make things better in America. This, this college was on the cutting edge of social reform. This becomes like the catalyst for all of this. You have trained uh, Christian missionaries. At the same time, there are anti-slavery activists that are going to this college. Very important. It becomes a safe haven for the Underground Railroad. Individuals who are escaping to eventually go to Canada oftentimes would wind up in Oberlin College first. Um, a lot of thinking is going to come out of this college that eventually is going to shape the United States. We get into the next thing, though, here, our concept 4.1, Roman numeral 2, letter C. You might have remembered in the other concept it talked about utopian societies. Well, just to further that, we have liberal social ideas from abroad, romantic beliefs in the human perfectibility. This begins to influence our literature, our art, our philosophy, and architecture. And a type of pseudo-religious philosophy emerges known as transcendentalism. The transcendentalists believe that you transcend your senses. Was it sight, sound, touch, taste? And there's a fifth one there, right? Sight, sound, touch, taste, hearing, hearing, hearing. Oh, that's what it is. Ha, ha, ha. You thought I forgot. No, I didn't. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I know a few of you probably thought I forgot. Emma, you thought I forgot, didn't you? I know you did. I know it. What's that, Miss Mano? You thought I forgot? No, I did not. Told you. I didn't. All right. So, you transcend your senses. It's like you have a sixth sense, if you will. It's sort of uh, a combination of old Puritan thinking, uh, newer Christian thought, some Eastern Buddhist type thought as well, like a Nirvana type thing where you can become one with the universe, you can transcend. This attracted mostly writers and artists, mostly Writers and artists became very, very caught up in this. Uh, and they started to desire to build perfect societies that they felt we can transcend our senses and become better people, more perfect people. Some of this becomes strange, though. Uh, the Oneida community, for instance, in 1848, founded by John Noyes. This is like a commune. He taught free love, birth control, uh, eugenics, all right, which is, uh, you know, trying to create the master race, by the way. Free love, he, he, the idea of what he called complex marriage. When you came to Anita, no one was allowed to be married to just one person. Everybody was married to everybody. Some people didn't like to do this, by the way, and would, would continue to con uh, secretly practice their marriage in secret, only to be found out about and often kicked out. Uh, only the best of the best could have children under his thinking. This is what we call eugenics, trying to make the best parents give us the best children. Um, I wonder where we ever heard this before, trying to create a better human, a master race. I don't know. I, eventually it'll come to me. I don't know. One of the other things he would do here is he would, he would practice something called mutual criticism. You would have, for instance, everyone ate together in a massive dining hall. When you were done, you'd go to this big auditorium, 
and one person would sit in a chair by themselves while everyone in the community got to stand up and criticize you, tell something that they don't like about you. Would you like that? Would you like that if I sat you in a chair in our classroom? As Pappas, would you like that? I don't think so. I don't know. I can say Jacob, and you won't know which Jacob I'm talking about because there's like 15 of them in my class right now. Would you guys like that? Any of you? Nope. Nope. Didn't think so. But remember, whatever everyone's saying about you that day, the next day you could sit in the audience and say it about somebody else. Right? He thought this was a way of keeping you humble. Right? The Anita community. It's not going to last. Some people sometimes recognize the name Onida. Eventually, what makes the community actually become more profitable, they start making silverware, spoons, knives, forks. In fact, today, you can still buy Anita-made forks, knives, and spoons. There's still a very popular company out there that still make silverware, and that's where they originate from, of all places. The leader of the Transcendentalist was a writer, as a poet, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He taught self-reliance, right? We, we need to rely on ourselves. We don't need handouts. Uh, Self-improvement, that we can improve our lot if we just work hard and we concentrate and we transcend. And what he called confidence and the freedom to do this. Now, this is important because after a while, Members of a political party known as the Whigs, a lot of Whigs will sort of become transcendentalists. Some full-on transcendentalists, others dabble in it. And this idea of self-reliance, the idea you don't need others to help you. You don't need government to help you. Eventually, as the Whigs fall apart, many of them become in a new political party, which is our modern Republican Party. Self-reliance, self-improvement. You don't need government to help you. A lot of that thought that is still sort of in the conservative movement today comes out of transcendentalism. Thought you might like to know that too. But the most famous guy is Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau, uh, one of his most famous books is a book called Walden. But one of his most famous speeches is on civil disobedience. I'll say that again. On civil disobedience. Henry David Thoreau gave a speech. The Mexican-American War was about to start. And he's going to condemn the Mexican-American War as a slave war. And civil disobedience means you are allowed to tell your government when they're wrong. You are allowed to protest. But you do it in a civil way. A peaceful way. His teachings are so important that eventually they will influence Mahat Gandhi in India, and Dr. Martin Luther King in the United States. In fact, Dr. King, his entire civil rights movement will be based basically on Henry David Thoreau's civil disobedience. Uh, later on, we're going to take a look at that speech, uh, on aspects of the speech, so you get a better idea of just how important this is. And he is one of the leaders of transcendentalism. All right, key concept 413A. Again, this is a big religious movement, but because of volunteerism and the need then to make things better. If I'm going to make my world better in a Christian way, I want to make it better in a social way. So new voluntary organizations emerge. They want to change individual behaviors. They want to improve society. The one they mentioned specifically is temperance. Temperance, temperance is the anti-alcohol uh, movement. <laughs> Wait. I know it's not that popular, but it was needed. Americans were punch drunk alcoholics at this time period. Yeah, they drank gallons of whiskey during this time period and other alcoholic beverages. It was getting out of hand. So a temperance movement, which actually means to temper your or moderate your alcohol consumption. By the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, temperance becomes prohibition, which then it becomes totally against or anti-alcohol. So these reform campaigns come of all types and they begin to flourish. Again, 
think back to something in the Puritan society. Think something about a perfect society. What was that thing? Oh, I know Leroy knows his hands up right now, but think, 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 think. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Jonathan Winthrop, right? A model of Christian charity. We shall be as a city upon a hill. I told you that thought is never going to leave us. We're always going to go back to a model of Christian charity and a city upon a hill. That was one of the big bases of this. In fact, I believe it's in the 1830s when that particular sermon gets actually published for the first time. We know it exists because it's in the Boston Museum, but the first time they publish it to be, to be read throughout the states is during this time period because they want a perfect society. They want a better America. So you get individuals like Dorothea Dix. And now Dorothea Dix, she becomes very, very interested in helping to reform prisons and asylums. She begins to realize the way we treat prisoners in this country is terrible. Now we're talking about individuals who are not committing major crimes, but they are being treated, they're being tortured, uh, they're, they're denied so many rights. She will work hard at eventually getting a bill through Congress that will start treating prisoners a little bit more kindly, but especially in the asylums. Individuals who, who have various mental disorders are, are treated unbelievably in this, in this country. Uh, there's a famous quote she has where she went into one and she saw all kinds of things, but what bothered her the most is individuals who are suffering from various things would often be chained naked to a wall while they dice, or doused ice water on them all day long, thinking that would cure them. Uh, other tortures that would be put upon individuals with mental disorders. She eventually does work hard throughout her life to eventually get change. Now it is noted that Ms. Dorothea did not join the suffrage movement, which was about voting rights. But she did that on purpose because she was too afraid if people associated her with suffrage, they would never take her seriously on her prison, prison and asylum reforms. But, you know, of course, she is for the right to vote, just so you know. Like I said, the temperance movement. We were a land of alcoholics. There's no doubt about this. Um, I should have brought the book home with me. I left it at school, but you're familiar with the book. We've talked about it. What Hath God Wrought by David Howe. Uh, if I remember, I'll, if you might remind me, I'll go and find that page and I'll quote to you just how much alcohol people were drinking at the time. It will surprise you. So this American Temperance Society comes, 1826. Again, we're trying to have that old-time religious spirit again. We've got to help improve our society. And one way we have to do this is to moderate how much people are drinking. T.S. Arthur writes a very popular book called Ten Nights in a Bar Room and What I Saw There. And he talks about gambling and prostitution and knife fighting. And basically nothing goes, nothing goes good in a bar room. Well, you know, I guess he's not in the right bar room. Anyways, but this becomes a major movement in America to try to make things better. Then you get someone like Horace Mann, who's from Massachusetts. Again, Massachusetts, the seat of where the Puritans come from. If you remember, they also loved education. He is the father of our modern education system. So whenever anyone says, well, who did that? Well, the man's doing this. The man does that. Yeah, it was Horace Mann. He's the guy that created the, the foundations for what we think now of our public school system. He really felt it was important that American children have a right to an education, right? I know sometimes we don't like him either, and I know, stop, stop, no, no, no. <laughs> Truthfully, you shouldn't do that. We don't want to live in our ignorance. I know maybe some of us do, but no, we should be thankful for the things that he's able to accomplish during his time period. I've always liked this political cartoon. It's called The Drunkard's Progress. Again, for temperance movement, it's the nine steps that you go through. You first, you just have a glass with your friends. Then you have a glass to keep the cold out. Mm. Then you have a glass too much and you can't even stay awake. Now you're drunk and you're, you're getting into fights. Now you're with your friends and you're gambling. Next you know, you're in poverty and you're diseased. Now you're, you're forsaken by your friends. 
And then you turn to crime and unfortunately suicide. While mom and your little daughter just look on and cry. That's a pretty sad thing there now that I think about it. But it was done that way on purpose to try to get people to think seriously about why we need reform why we need change when it comes to our drinking habits. And this was very powerful in the 1830s and 40s, uh, this particular uh, political cartoon. Well, the biggest of all the movements will be abolition. Abolition springs right out of the Second Great Awakening. Charles Finney, Lyman Beecher, who's another very famous preacher, all these men began to preach that if we need America to be better, we have got to end slavery. In fact, when uh, Charles Finney would serve in an Episcopalian church, he would refuse to give communion to anyone who was a slave owner because he felt they were an unrepentant sinner. Uh, and these men really meant it. They felt all human beings should be free. So enslaved blacks and free African Americans helped to create these communities. They helped to create strategies to protect their dignity family structures, they also eventually joined the political efforts to change. Perhaps the most famous is Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, a runaway slave, who eventually joins the movement and becomes one of the leading voices in, for African Americans of the 19th century. We'll wind up talking more about Frederick Douglass in class. In fact, we're going to read his famous speech, uh, The Meaning of the Fourth of July. It's a very powerful speech. Uh, you can only perhaps already imagine from coming from an African-American point of view, what would the 4th of July mean to him? So we're gonna, di we're gonna dissect that speech in class. The guy you're probably not too familiar with is David Walker, another African-American who wrote a pamphlet, Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World, where he has his appeal for freedom and the end of slavery. Oftentimes, we talked about there were free blacks in America, in the South as well. We read an excerpt from one of the books that talked about North Carolina and Tennessee, even given some voting rights. But the majority of free black in America were not enfranchised. Enfranchisement means your right to vote. So where there's going to be hundreds of thousands of free individuals, both in the North, the South, the East, and the West, the great majority of them will not be able to vote. They are disenfranchised. Many fear that the attack on slavery would lead to an all property rights, right? That's what Southerners will always come with. You're coming after my property. What's next? You're going to take away my homes. You're going to take away my wagons. This, again, is that Heron Vogue philosophy that we looked up, uh, which is racially based and not really thinking about humanity, right? Not thinking on terms of humanity. Northerners were not all kumbaya people, though. Wage earners, those who have a job, right, feared that if we began to free the slaves, they would come north and they would start to compete for jobs. The one group especially who will not really like abolition are the Irish, because the Irish fought really, really hard to get their rights to work and vote. And they always felt like they were treated less than slaves. And in a lot of respects, they were. But they are not going to like abolition for the most part. It's time to take a drink of a nice beverage. I'm currently drinking uh, Gatorade Frost. Cool Frost. It's the light blue one. It's, it's cold and, and refreshing right now. Hmm. So go ahead and take a drink, take a pause, go get something to eat, come back, and we'll finish this up. All right, nice to have you back. So yes, we stopped here with abolition. What this does do is it exposes the extent of white prejudice in America. Uh, individuals in the North who did not own slaves or ever did, you begin to understand that maybe they weren't going to they never thought about freedom or why it would be important or not wanting, again, like we said, all of a sudden free all the slaves and they come to my neighborhood. That became a fear of a lot of individuals. But abolitionists, again, 
The majority of them are going to be white men and women who are going to fight to end slavery, who will also be joined by men like Frederick Douglass and other black activists in order to stop this. So here I got Frederick Douglass's name and David Walker. Again, he wrote Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World. Continuing here, now it's 413B. So again, we see abolitionists and anti-slavery movements. There is a gradual emancipation in the North. Most Northern states, if you remember, we had the Northwest Ordinance that got passed during the Articles of Confederation that outlawed slavery, but only in the Old Northwest, which was Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Michigan. Those states didn't have slavery, but eventually New York does. New York has slavery, so they're going to gradually start to start trying to free slaves there. Massachusetts will free. Pennsylvania will start giving uh, emancipation. So we get a large population of free African Americans, as I've been telling you, by the time of the Civil War. However, their rights will always be restricted. Anti-slavery efforts in the South were largely limited to unsuccessful slave rebellions. Abolition obviously is going to be banned in the South. They are not going to allow abolitions to come. In fact, I'm going to show you one in a moment. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison, who is like the father of abolition, the South will put a bounty on his head, want it dead or alive. They think he's that dangerous of a man. Andrew Jackson! And the Democratic Party, which remember the Democratic Party is what is left of Jefferson's Republican Party, a state's rights party that doesn't like a strong government, although Andrew Jackson is a pretty strong president. Um, they're also not really keen on the market revolution, you know, because of state's rights. And they're not really keen on the idea of abolition and the Great Awakening and all this sort of stuff. Eventually, we get a gag rule passed in 1836. Um, where you're not allowed to bring up, you're not, you know, it's like the first rule of Fight Club. First rule of Fight Club, can't talk Fight Club. So the first rule of Congress, can't talk abolition. Jackson also got restrict, uh, restrict the use of mail by any abolitionist. He didn't like the fact that they were using the U.S. mail to, to, to distribute their pamphlets around the country. That's how Jackson felt about this. Uh, slave rebellions, Nat Turner's is the most famous I'm going to actually do that in class. Um, over 50 white people will be, will be uh, murdered by his rebellion. Uh, and we're going to get into some of the very details of what it was he was doing. He came at it again from a very strong religious point of view. And this is probably a lot of reasons why the South didn't like the Great Awakening. Because Turner was apparently uh, influenced by religious thought. And he could also read and write. And that began to fear the South. And eventually many Southern states start slowly passing laws where slaves won't be allowed to read and write anymore after Nat Turner's rebellion. Like I said, I'm going to go into more detail in the classroom about that. But here's William Lloyd Garrison. His famous newspaper, The Liberator. The first publication is 1831. And here's what he had in the very first publication. I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, he's speaking about immediate emancipation, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate and I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch and I will be heard. And like a lightning bolt, William Lloyd Garrison comes onto the American scene. He will fight and fight and fight for the immediate emancipation of slaves. Like I said, the South will put a bounty, wanted dead or alive, on his head. Equivocate means to beat around the bushes. I will not equivocate, right? Sort of like when you're getting ready to leave the house, right? You're getting ready to leave the house and your mom says, Hey, where are you going? You go, Oh, you know, I'm a... I'm not going anywhere, just, you know, going to hang out. Well, who are you going to hang out with? Oh, oh, you know, I don't know, some friends. Ah, you know, just some friends going to hang out. Not real big deal. Well, who are you going with? Where are you going? Ah, ah, don't really know. Don't really know. We might drive around. I don't know. Maybe it's someone's house. I don't know. Study A-push. I don't know. 
I'll call you later, Mom. See you later, bye. And you didn't really tell them what you're really going to do, right? That's equivocating. He said he would not equivocate. Uh, he's the guy also who will take in a very young Frederick Douglass and train him to become a great orator, a great speaker, and an abolitionist. They have a major falling out because William Lloyd Garrison believes only from a religious point of view. Uh, he does not want any political involvement whatsoever. He believes all of that is of Satan the devil. When Frederick Douglass starts to turn more political, the two have a major falling out, and then they won't work together anymore because of that. Because women were so much involved in abolition, as your concept here now in 413C will tell you, a whole women's right movement that comes out of this. If it wasn't for abolition, there'd be no strong women's right movement at that time period. If it wasn't for the Great Awakening, there wouldn't be an abolitionist movement, right? So you can see one causes, one effects. Women were central to the abolitionist movement, but they grew increasingly conscious of the fact that as they're trying to help individuals become free, they are in a sense in slavery as well. They're in a social slavery. They're not considered citizens of the United States either. In some areas, they're considered perpetual minors they, without land rights, without basic rights. Other states do give land rights. As I told you though earlier, as the West gets developed, once we cross the Mississippi and states start to emerge out West, that's where women begin to have their basic rights because you don't have enough people, you need voters. So women eventually do get voting rights, but out West. In the East and in what is the old Northwest? No. So a women's rights or a suffrage movement begins. You may remember this thing called the Republican motherhood. Women were going to take on an elevated stature in society, but that developed in this thing called cult of domesticity, that women need to stay home. The, tra the traditional gender role was for them to be home. They saw that as domestic slavery. They weren't allowed to leave. But as the Great Awakening happened, and oftentimes men would be angry with their wives leaving, but women would say, don't you want your sons and your daughter to live in a better world? And the husband would say, well, yeah. Well, I'm just trying to make sure that it's better for them. And husbands didn't have an argument for that. And some husbands worked with them for this. Others just stayed out of it. Uh, new reform programs obviously will lead, like I said, to property rights in the 1840s. Eventually, many women in some of the states do get rights to own their own property. Imagine having to fight for the right to own your own stuff. But that's what they had to do. And you see Seneca Falls is mentioned right here. 1848, Seneca Falls is the name of a town, a city, up, upstate New York. They hold a massive convention up there where they Elizabeth Cady Stanton who's this lady here, she will write the Declaration of Sentiments. Now, what is the Declaration of Sentiments? Well, if you've ever read or are you familiar with the Declaration of Independence, it's basically the same thing word for word, only it becomes more about gender. Instead of saying all men are created equal, it's all men and women created equal. Instead of listing 27 grievances or complaints against the King of England, they list 27 complaints against men and society, right? And it becomes a famous document, and everybody there signs it. Uh, I do have a copy of it in my classroom. Not like a real copy, you know, like a, you know, like a printout copy. But, you know, we'll take a look at that as well in class. But this begins the big push now for suffrage. And eventually, it's going to be, uh, let's see, 40, 60, 70 years, something like that, before the 19th Amendment will actually be passed. But now, because of abolition... Women are now fighting for their basic rights. And I'm going, to start, I'm going to end it here with this one here. Key concept. And I brought my concepts with me because I didn't write these out. But 4.22, A, B, and C. If you're looking there, it tells you increasing numbers of Americans, especially women and men working in factories, right? Uh, and B, the growth of manufacturing drove a significant increase in prosperity and standards of living at home. 
Uh, and C, gender and family ro roles change in response to the market revolution, right? This idea of domestic spheres. And a great experiment is going to happen in America. The factory girls in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, the textile industry has come. Francis Cabot Lowell went to England in 1811. If that, that date should ring a bell to you because something very important is going to happen in 1812 and he's not going to be able to come back to America because of that. Yeah, it's the war. You're right. Um, so here you go. He went there to look at the textile factories of England, basically to spy on them. England has a law that you're not allowed to take any of their technology or any of their, or their knowledge about how to build textile machinery out of England. This is a loom. One of the greatest inventions of mankind is the loom. Basically a precursor to the microchip in a lot of respects. It's an English secret. He goes there. He's not allowed to bring any pencil or paper with him. But he would go visit, go back to his hotel room, and begin to draw everything he can remember. Because of the war, he's trapped there, but he keeps going to their factories. And that way he can get more detail. When he finally gets back to America... He wants to build massive factories now utilizing this loom technology. But he's got an idea. A good labor source could be the surrounding women. Not a lot of people like this idea, but he really pushed for it. He really thought this would be a great idea. Let's get women involved in their own industry. Now, Francis will die before the first factory it actually goes online, and, in, and, uh, and to honor him, they will rename this town Lowell, Massachusetts, and they will continue what he wanted to do. What they'll do is they'll build these massive dormitories. These are young women in their teens and early 20s. They're all single, but they treat it like a college. You come in there, you do your job, but they have uh, social activities for them. Uh, they brought in uh, teachers to teach them how to hold a bank account uh, what a savings account is, what a checking account is, taught them about how to participate in the market economy. There are diaries and diaries of women who went through this and it became successful and began to spread throughout the North using women, but they went through this system. Once they got to a certain age, usually around mid-20s, they were encouraged to leave and to become uh, prosperous members of society. And well, of course, in this time period, encourage them to get married but they learned so much they learned an economic sense of independence so think about this you've got a religious movement that's teaching volunteerism you've got a democratic movement that's teaching you know volunteerism you've got all these social movements and now women are getting involved in their own economy making their own choices on when to save money when to spend money when they want to get married and when they don't want to get married. It only added to this entire movement and why women become very, very important to the entire social reform movement. We also see a rise of the business class and the business, I'm sorry, the business elite and the middle class. Urban centers are starting to emerge in America because of all this activity. And like I said, there in letter C, this domestic feminism, and a repeat again what I said earlier, the cult of domesticity, which women are going to fight against. All right, well, that's it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed. This probably went a little longer than you thought. But again, you can watch it over the weekend. You can just watch it 10 minutes at a time. So ha ha ha. All right, see everybody later. Bye-bye.